Okay, today, or actually this evening, I'm recording this on a Saturday evening, uh, I get an opportunity to do something really special. This is podcast number 74, and in my life, uh, 74 has a special ring to it. Working for Cycling 74 uh, certainly is a big part of that, and there's kind of some, some numerology built into the number 74. And so when I was talking about doing this podcast... I had an inter- interesting conversation with someone who suggested themselves for the 74th podcast, and I thought it couldn't be more appropriate. Um, the interview tonight is with David Ziccarelli, the owner of Cycling 74, and uh, my colleague, and luckily for me, my friend. So with that, we say hello to David. Hi, David. How are you? Hi, Darren. Um, not too bad. Um, Thanks a lot for doing uh, this interview with us and for doing it late in the evening like this. I I know you're a busy guy, but I appreciate you taking the time to do it. No problem. I um, enjoy listening to the other ones, so hopefully mine can be half as interesting as the rest of them. Well, I'm pretty sure it's, it's, uh, it's going to be. If for no other reason, then I think for a lot of people you're kind of a mystery or maybe the opposite. You're just a person who's always been around. One of the things I like doing in my podcast is asking people to tell me a little bit about their history and how they got to be uh, the artist uh, or developer or whatever, how they got to be the person they are. And in your case, I think it's really interesting because the stuff you do spans both creating as well as artistry as well as design work it, it really is kind of a mishmash of almost everything that is art art and design so i'm really curious about how you got where you are well i don't know but i could tell you a few experiences that randomly come to my mind when um you asked me that question one was my childhood i was the youngest of um, four siblings. My three brothers um, are all quite a bit older, and I think you interviewed my brother Tom. Right. And he had some influence on my life, let's put it that way. But I grew up in a pretty musical family and um, a family very interested in electronics, uh, in particular ham radio. Back in the 1960s, uh, it was maybe more common than it was for a long time until very recently that people had soldering irons. My brothers and maybe even my dad liked to put um, electronic stuff together. My dad was really into hi-fi. One of the things that he did, and I don't know how unusual this was, but he was a home taping enthusiast and had tons of reel-to-reel tapes. He, uh, I mean, this huge Ampex tape recorder and he liked to record uh, interviews with our relatives, such as my grandmother and various, you know, trying to get a family history. And he um, somehow ended up with a pair of Voice of the Theater speakers, which are the, you know, like five foot tall, three foot deep speakers that you'd find in um, auditoriums back in that, in that time. Right. And they were just in our basement. One afternoon, my parents were, in, were out of town, I think, when the speakers had recently arrived. My brothers decided it might be kind of fun to see if they could generate a low-frequency tone that would uh, shatter the windows in the house. And um, so one of the ways that they did this was we had a, we had a second, uh, much lamer tape recorder. And back then, the reel-to-reel tape recorders had adjustable speeds, like three and three quarters inches per second and seven and seven eighths or something like that. So you could, you could take something that you recorded on one and then speed it up and re-record it on the other. And basically, it shifted it down an octave. Right. So... They kept doing this over and over again until the thing was as low as the speakers would generate. And then they just cranked the volume up um, such that we couldn't even be in the house. Unfortunately, no windows broke. But, you know, it's not like that sort of thing happened every day. But that was kind of like, you know, all this stuff was around. And um, it was kind of the gestalt of the household, huh? Right. (laughs) And it was like, you know, that was kind of a form of play or something like that. When I was in high school, my 
brother Tom got really into music and he was interested in doing it professionally. And he bought a ARP Odyssey and tried to show me how to use it. And I just found it really interesting. And eventually I decided I needed my own synthesizer. So I bought a Oberheim two voice, which is like the four voice is like a analog synthesizer, but it had a little sequencer in it. Right. And you could sequence the, I th- I don't remember what you could sequence, but had a tiny keyboard and you know this is the kind of thing that like these days people would kill for and eventually I got a DX7 and I sold the two voice for $85 because I just thought it was completely lame. <laughs> I started doing some recording with a friend of mine in high school, Jeff Carpenter, who was a great songwriter, went on to have a really awesome band called Something Fierce. You can still kind of find their album someplace. I don't know. Really clever lyricist and had a voice a little bit like Elvis Costello, but then it kind of became his own voice, I guess. So we would often do this kind of recording late at night and had the synthesizer. And and um, that's I, I guess that's how I started to get interested in this. At the same time, I took piano lessons. And then uh, when I went to... Uh, college i did that a little bit more but i also did computers and math i guess the you know really formative experience for me was hearing and the, the first semester i was at college i had joel chatterby as a teacher from my electronic music class at the college i went to bennington it's in vermont and they had a um i don't remember the you know number of it but a giant mode modular system right that was like kind of fun but Joel had uh, he would say well I I have a mini computer that makes sound and actually have it at the studio but one one time he just he was gonna play a concert at the college and he brought the computer and and set it up and just the thing uh, had this interactive algorithm where you could wave your hand in front of this theremin and you could control the orchestration of the music so it would get more complicated. And so it was generating an algorithm that you could, you could also sort of interact with it. There was another piece that kind of just didn't have as much control over it. It was called Rhythms. And there's a great album that he made recording of this piece. It's a, a duet for the computer and a percussionist. And there was a sound, like he was making kind of FM sounds that were percussive in in nature. And there was just a sound that this thing was making that I thought there was a combination of the FM, the auditorium, like it was very, you know, there's no one in it. So it kind of had a lot of reverb and just the sound of the random algorithm. And I just was like, this is what I, this is what I love. Like this sound, it's not... I didn't like, I mean, the conceptual thing was cool, but it was actually the sound that was what was life-changing for me. I was interested in improvisation, and I, and to this day, I try to some extent to improvise like a random number generator, because I just <laughs> like, I like the sound that um, comes from this kind of, every note has the equal chance right. of happening. Um, maybe there are equal they have equal chances within a scale, but that kind of the thing that just sort of suggests a melody that you would never come up with if you were, you know, playing what was under your fingers. Right. It's interesting that, that the sound is what, is what drew you in because for the amount of time that I've known you, and I think uh, even before that, my assumption always was that, the draw was the technology and maybe even the difficulty of the technology at the time. I mean, for for Joel to have a system that could even make any noise must have been pretty bleeding edge at the time, right? Uh, yeah, it was a New England digital system. Oh, so okay. they made right, the right. Synclavier. And right. so this was the like the rack mount computer that they made um, was their first product before they actually made the the Synclavier. Right. Oh, okay. That makes that makes sense. When I went to music school, I actually was involved a little bit, and I mostly was kind of a guinea pig for uh, some early stuff that they were doing to try and get your training working on, like old PDP elevens and stuff, and or PDP eights. I think it was. And um, I just remember that at that time, literally, to try and make it make any noise at all, they were hand-wiring uh, 
resistor res, uh, resistor networks in order to make uh, DAX and stuff. It was really ultra crude and a pretty rough sled to even make those things squirt out any noise at all. Uh, if you listen to the record now, you're definitely like, oh, there's some aliasing there. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, that was part of the sound. It was like right. that, as you say, it drew, drew me in. So I, um, I can still hear that day in my head. I guess everything that I think about doing probably re- relates back to that, you know, that's the, the starting point is right. thinking about that sound. So once you heard that and, and that spoke to you, what were the next steps? How did you activate that in your life then? What did I do? Well, so I tried to learn uh, a bit about computer programming. After I graduate, and I was in a total hurry to get out of school and like do something with this, with this stuff. I didn't know what it was. I applied to all the schools that in the U.S. and, and Canada that had, you know, that I had heard had some kind of computer music stuff going on. And I got rejected from all of them because if they were music schools, like, you know, I was, uh, I had a jazz background, so that's not going to, there's no yeah, music that's school right. that's going to ex- accept that. And if they were computer science uh, departments, then, you know, I didn't, I hadn't taken the right classes, let's put it that way. Sure, okay. So, you know, this is basically at that time, uh, I want to go into a, like a competitive PhD program in computer science. It's like you have to go to MIT or liberal arts college is not going to do it for you. So right. I was kind of in, in this no man's land academically. And then after I got all these rejections, Andy Schloss and David Jaffe showed up uh, at Bennington. They were they had gone there earlier, and they were both at Karma at Stanford. They were like, "Oh well, if you want to go to Stanford, don't don't apply to the music department. Uh, David's in the music department. He's miserable, but um, <laughs> but Andy's in this really cool with this really cool guy Earl Schubert in this hearing and speech department, and um, he gets to basically do whatever he wants." The, the professor who runs the department's really into computer music, and um, there's all these people doing these really great psychoacoustic experiments with making making the, the stimuli with computer-generated sounds and thinking about how this can reveal more information about perception. And I was like, psychology? I'd never thought about psychology before. So um, I had to pretend that I was interested in psychology. Um, <laughs> And they accepted me, but they didn't have any money. So I got to Stanford and I, you know, start, I took a class at, at the computer music lab, but I had enough money for one order of tuition. At that time, it was only $6,000, but that's all I had in the bank. And, and my strategy was, okay, I've got to find some support outside of this department that I'm in, which I guess I was the last student accepted and they were going to shut the department down and not replace the professor. And, um, <laughs> So on the last day I was there, I got an interview with a guy who ran the undergraduate computer science education program, the computer science department. And he's like, well, we really need people like you because all our PhD students don't really speak English very well. So um, anyone who actually knows about computers who can speak English uh, and you have have a little teaching experience, so it looks good to me. I was able to get support out of them and that. It, that basically allowed me to actually stay there and finish my PhD, although it took nine years. And it was really true. This guy, Earl Schubert, like basically was like whatever I was interested in, he was, he was interested in supporting. And I ended up doing a highly theoretical and philosophical dissertation that was kind of like the history of psychoacoustics research, psychoacoustics research in, a, in a very specific area and with some crazy ideas in it and he he was completely cool with it so it was like basically kind of like going to college for the the second time or something like that he was always suggesting that i you know take classes with that he had heard were really good and it was it was really a a fantastic experience that's pretty neat what what years were was Uh, i started there in 84 okay and um finished in 94. Okay, that's that's a real interesting time frame, but also clearly you were doing other stuff during that time as well because um, That's why it took 9 years. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that explains it. It's interesting it's that time frame. I remember 
there seemed to be a lot of excitement around psychoacoustics in the mid 80s. And I don't even remember why other than I think people were toying around with using psychoacoustics for like doing weirdo mix techniques and stuff like that. And there was a whole bunch, of, there was a big hoopla about it and then it kind of died away pretty quickly. And I'm not even sure why. Well, one of the interests at Stanford was in, I mean, maybe if someone were listening to me characterize the, this, that would be like, you're, I'm not really saying it right. But in, in retrospect, it feels like data reduction, kind of like, you know, JPEG is a um, perceptual, you know, the idea that you won't notice the details that they leave out of the compressed image. Right. So there's compressed audio. Uh, which is kind of a similar thing where you you take a Fourier ta- transform of the sound and then you look at what's not salient information at, in the spectral domain. But there's actually another thing related to that, which was what's the minimum you need? So let's say that you um, you want to recreate the, the a sound of a real instrument. One of the ways that you could reduce the data is by simplifying the envelopes the sort of timbre envelopes. Mm-hmm. And so there was this idea that maybe through the intersection of computer synthesis and uh, psychoacoustics research, we could kind of figure out what is the essence of a trumpet, kind of, mm. in, in a computational way. What it, distinguishes one instrument from another? Right. There were a couple of things. I remember like the Roland LA stuff where... You know, their their shtick was, and, and I think Insonic did this with some of their earlier machines as well, where the idea was that the attack, you know, was sample-based in a way that would be really clearly the trumpet's attack. But as long as you could register that it was a trumpet at the attack time, then they could practically play a triangle wave and you would still consider it the sound of a trumpet. Right. So you can imagine that one of the reasons that um, people were interested in this is computers are really slow. Right. So now computers aren't slow. And so the whole thing kind of seems like, why did we bother? (laughs) Um, Because philosophically, like you're not really necessarily finding the essence of instruments this way. Right. What seems more interesting would be could you find a computational model of an instrument that would allow you to, to, imp, to sort of manipulate it in some way? And that would be more like physical modeling, I guess. Right. And that was one of the, uh, one of the things that was going on at Stanford at the same time as well. Julius Smith was there and he's kind of had done a lot of really interesting stuff with a waveguide mm-hmm. model and identifying systems and trying to recreate them with like pressure pressure models of acoustic instruments, you know, like clarinet or whatever. I took a few of these classes. Okay, so here's here's my confession. I didn't finish any of the classes because like <laughs> they, they just went way too fast for me. And then I was at kind of a crisis, like a, toward the end of my time in grad school, where they closed, actually did finally close down my department because Earl Schubert, the professor, had retired and they didn't want to replace him right and so i had to go to some graduate school office to find out like how am i going to meet the requirements to get my degree and i like like they decided they would they would allow me to finish even though the department didn't exist but everything had to be administered by some you know person in an administrative department rather than an academic department at that point i was like well i've got all these classes that i took with julius and i but i have incompletes in them all and the woman said you know, it doesn't matter whether you actually got um, a grade in the class. It's whether you paid the tuition. Oh, my goodness. And I'm like, thank you for telling me that now. <laughs> wow. All right. <laughs> Administration comes to the so, rescue, huh? Yeah, right. So it's like a kind of like they called it residency requirement or whatever. And you, had, you know, a certain number of credits. And I'm like, right. oh, OK. So residency basically means like paying the money. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you were there, but it really means you paid to pay to right. be there. I mean, I tried to. I, I put in an effort. To, <laughs> not much of one, you know. But um, So the other thing that was going on at that time was, so uh, just to back up a little bit, that remember the crazy mini computer with this awesome sound? So Joel had worked with a guy, and I, I think his name was Roger Myers, but uh, 
anyway, um, he invented this language, and I think it was called Play 2 or something like that. And it was uh, basically a way to type commands to the computer. So you could basically write these kind of algorithms that, that Joel was interested in in this language. So there was this guy that I happened to meet while I was at Stanford who set up a, a little stand for, I can't remember what the occasion was, but he had a DX7, I think, and a Macintosh, and there was a MIDI interface between the Macintosh. This is like, you know, very early 128K or 512K Macintosh, you know, with a tiny screen. Uh, and, but he, had, he was having it play music from a computer program and it was sending information over the MIDI cable to play the DX7. And I thought that was pretty neat, you know, be able to play something on your DX7 into a computer and then have play it back. Um, so this turned out to be Dave Oppenheim, who founded hmm. Opcode Systems. And it turned out that he um, had written a paper for Computer Music Journal that he had ported this language, Play 2 or whatever it was called, to the Z80. So it was, it was just a weird coincidence that, like, all these things in my life came together. So I bought a MIDI interface from Dave and it's like, okay, well, I have this DX7 and I made some cool sounds with it with the front panel, but it looks like it has like a protocol that you could actually change the sounds from uh, MIDI uh, system exclusive. So I was like, I could write a program to edit the patches on the DX7. Already I had this, had been thinking about programming the Macintosh and I, I had this weird job where I was kind of working occasionally and the company was kind of vaguely interested in maybe having their program that I had written for the IBM PC run on a Mac. It was a program for scoring psychological tests. So I, I had a little bit of experience like, with early programming uh, on the Macintosh. So I started trying to write a little patch editor for the DX7. That was sort of you know, how I got into the world of music software programming or whatever. Right. Um, Who were you writing that for? Just for yourself initially? I'm just going to write it for myself. Like I think I did it over the summer uh, between my um, first year at Stanford and my second year. Oh, okay. Um, then I showed it to Dave, and I, yeah, we'd really like to publish this. And you know, they took it to the NAMM show and showed it to people. And so uh, once I finished it, then it was kind of like a, a publishing arrangement. I wasn't actually an employee of Opcode. Okay. I will say that um, after I wrote that program, I never made another patch for the DX7. <laughs> so the only patches that I've ever made for DX7 were on the front panel. That's hilarious. Is it, does, isn't that just about right, though? There, the process of going through the detail of figuring it out just makes it so that you don't even want to see it anymore. Um, this has been a constant thing in my life. Is like, <laughs> um, you know, when I, and it's gotten true increasingly over time, is like the more software I write, the less I actually use the software to do something that I might have done before I wrote the software. Sure, sure. Now, in order to make that DX7 editor, I... And maybe you can just tell me I'm completely wrong, but it seems to me that in order to do that, you actually had to develop some standards that we sort of think of as normalized in terms of software and software synthesis stuff, like how envelopes are displayed or how how you adjust numbers on the fly and stuff like that. As As I recall... You, you were kind of having to make that stuff up as you went. Yeah, I, I think that I can't remember um, how original the envelope representation was. The DX7 had like a, a time from 0 to 99 and then a level. And I was like, oh, if I represent this as a, a little box that you can move around, then as you move the box to the left the time should actually increase because I think the the higher the number, the faster the time. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly how it worked. And then if you move the the box up and down, then it should be representation of the level. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of thing that people go to school for now. But I, I just uh, it was just like a random insight that I had. 
think I had a job like teaching computers to high school kids at the time. Okay. You know? And it just just occurred to me that I could do it that way. You know, there were other people who were trying to do a lot more ambitious things, like actually represent the the Bessel functions and show you what the spectrum would look like. And I think I sort of had this insight around that, which was you don't need to see reality. You just need to manipulate. Like you need to, the manipulation has to have some kind of intuition. Right, right. And and this this is actually sort of true in a psychological way. Like the world is not linear and we do things with our bodies to move things around in space. And we, when I say like the world is not linear, like uh, we have this perception that we're moving things in, in linear space, but they're not, or our perception of time is not linear either. So it turned out that the numbers between zero and 99, it sounds like a linear scale, but it's actually, those are basically indices into some kind of exponential table or something like that okay and it wasn't necessary to uh to actually duplicate the actual time constants that yamaha was using for for what zero meant versus 99 right you could just basically make it linear because we would sort of we would be linear like like they already had the insight right like sure this is already a linear space that we're like (laughs) non-linearizing right and so you could just actually apply that to, to real space and the pixels of the screen. And it was just as good. So you had this licensing arrangement with, with Opcode. That, that was one of the first software packages they had. Because if I recall right, their first product was actually like the, the MIDI interface, right? MIDI interface. And then they had the MIDI Mac sequencer, which later became oh, Vision right. once yes. uh, they added audio to it. Right. So, or actually, they, they actually uh, didn't add audio at first. Then it was Studio Vision or the audio. I mean, how excited were you that someone would say, hey, this we're going to rock with this, and all of a sudden you find yourself one of the few software developers in the music world? I mean, did that even register for you? Or, did um, you, or didn't you care? Well, you know, there was no... No way to have a sense of your audience the way there is now, like you can go on the internet and see that people are downloading your software or whatever. So it's like they put an ad in keyboard magazine and then people start calling. So the, and, and, and the people, often the people who are calling are like a music store ordering, you know, basically what was like a big ring binder with a, a floppy disk. In it. it was, it started very, uh, in a very mellow way in that sense, like, I remember, like by by contrast, when I actually started Cycling Seventy Four, and we put up the website, and I put an announcement on the Max mailing list that uh, you could buy this program that would do audio uh, in inside Max called MSP. Like you know, we sold like thousands of dollars worth of software in like a, a two days. Right. It was wasn't like that, you know. And I didn't actually have very much direct contact with any customers at all like in fact if someone wanted to talk to me about the software they would type up a letter they usually had a macintosh so they'd probably (laughs) type it out uh, and then they would send me a letter you know with maybe some ideas or something like that right it was kind of all in your like just thinking of what to do with the software is kind of in your head like there was no bug database and you know constant stream of evaluations and, and that sort of thing yeah, yeah so I was thinking that the um the main place that there there was some excitement was going to trade shows right because you'd actually meet people and 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 they could tell you things in person about liking the software or whatever. um so very quickly after the dx7 editor uh, came out I got uh, back in touch with Joel Chadwick, who had this idea that he he wanted to explore. You know, it was like, well, there's a MIDI synthesizer and there's a computer and the computer can talk to the MIDI synthesizer. This is like everything he ever wanted to do. Now, anyone can do it, or at least he imagined, you know, like this could just go in someone's living room. And he, he had this idea that, he could take the same ideas, which he called interactive composition, and build something for the mass market. 
So that became sort of, uh, other than, you know, what I was doing in grad school, that became like the computer programming focus quickly switched from writing patch editors or synthesizers to, I think, what I was really passionate about, which was thinking about how a computer could shape compositional practice. And in particular, I was really interested in this interactive composition idea that it, it seemed to have a strong connection with my interest in improvisation. The composition would evolve through your interaction with this algorithm and you would be influencing it and shaping it. And the original conception that we had was based on a flight simulator, a very early flight simulator for the Mac called Fokker Triplane, I think. Yes, I remember that. The idea was like all the controls are there all, all at once. And so you can just, you know, mess with anything immediately. You just move your mouse over to the control and move it and the you know, plane re- reacts to that. Mm-hmm. Like you didn't have to go to a different screen. So we basically said, all right, we're going to make the airplane cockpit of music composition. Uh, every control for this algorithm is going to be on the screen at the same time. And you can just get an idea and immediately go to that thing and, and try it. I, I think this remains a kind of tension in the user interface design things that I do to this day. It's like you either, people want to see everything or they want to see nothing. Right, right. Um, and so how do you reveal information in a way that facilitates the creative process the creative process is like it's not like you have an idea and then you go to the computer and you realize the idea you, you sit down at the computer and you expect the the machine to participate in inspiring you mm-hmm. and so if you take that then you kind of want to see a bunch of stuff because you can't be inspired by total blankness. But if you see too much, then you're just like, what is going on here? I have no idea. Coming up with that right balance uh, is just an endless challenge and will probably you know, keep me preoccupied for the, for the rest of my life. Yeah, well, I, I wonder if, in fact, there is actually a goal to be reached because... There are some people that are intrigued by the complexity of all the data on the screen at once. And then there are other people that really are like, I don't understand why software isn't more like boss guitar pedals, right? Two knobs and a switch, and I can do everything I want. And I I wonder if there is no sweet, there is no right spot. There's just more like a right spot for each individual. Well, I think the guitar pedal is not the right spot <laughs> because, um, I mean, there are people who could be really creative with two knobs and a switch, but um, when someone says, I can do everything I want, um, first I'm immediately questioning, like, how do you know what you want? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think, okay, well, if you know what you want, then you're probably like just doing some conservative thing that you're you're always doing and you're not really challenging what you want like you're not growing as an artist in that sense right if you're so sure of what you want then you're either a genius or you're lazy yeah yeah i i completely agree and and it's not even always clear at the moment which that is now in in discussing these compositional assistance. I don't know what what would you call these programs because my interaction with the world there are a lot of sort of commonalities. So one of the commonalities I get is when I talk to a certain group of people and they are generally of a certain age and of a certain background they'll say, you know, what do you do for a living and I say that I work for Cycling 74 and they're like, "Oh, that's David Zicarelli's thing." And I'm like, "Yes, it is." And they say, oh, you know what? There was a time when I did all my work with, and they'll, they'll either mention M or Jambox, or Jam Factory, I mean. And they, they talk about that as if that was, I, I don't know, they talk about it in the same way that other people talk about the great bands that they were in and the people that they collaborated with. It's really interesting, and it's really, there's like an emotional factor that came with that. 
Now, did you feel at the time that that was occurring, or were you just like trying to make something that was cool? Or did you really think that you were, were making sort of like the composer's assistant? I'm not going to, I don't know that I can answer that, but the, <laughs> the thing that came to mind when you're like, what, what you're basically asking, like, what did I think of this yeah. uh, in terms of what other people were doing? And the thing that I found most fascinating was the people who were too embarrassed to admit that they were using the software, right? So in other words, like it was challenging their sense of authorship. Right. I don't think people feel this way anymore, oh, but at the time, I don't think so either. Um, but at the time, there was something about like decision making that is a little different than it is now, or something. I mean, it's definitely people who who don't want you to know that they did whatever they did with Max, but they have usually very different reasons for that, which is kind of like somehow it's okay if they got a person to help them, but if they got a programming language to help them, it's like, oh well, shouldn't they? have known how to program you know what i mean right, it's like right yeah you know. but this is a this was a different thing it was like am i really the i mean I, you know i i wouldn't necessarily say anything other than that you are the composer of whatever you do with one of these pieces of software but it, it was there was a difference of how people thought about it yeah, well, it's actually kind of funny to even think about it now when uh, there are so many things that we just naturally apply to, to music making. I think of like, you know, a really good example is like in Ableton, the way that, you know, people will just say, oh, my drumming track is kind of crap. I'm just going to slap a uh, beat repeat on it. There's not a second where they think that that, is seeding the composition to the developer of beat repeat. Yeah, that's just a tool and they they happen to it's just like picking up a different paintbrush or something. Right, right. I was kind of like flopping back and forth between the Mac and the PC at the time and I happened to be over on the PC side when a bunch of this stuff occurred. And so the kind of Jam Factory world kind of passed me by. You did Jam Factory, you did Oval Tune, right? Mm -hmm. You did some kind of percussion thing too, right? Um, I didn't actually work on that too much. That was John Offenhartz is the main oh, okay. um, guy who worked on that. It was called Upbeat. Upbeat, that's uh, it. And a lot of people feel like that was sort of the hippest <laughs> oh, yeah. one. I mean, they all had kind of the same core uh, technology, if you want. Okay. Can I say it that way? I like to think of it as like there are two processes going on. There's like the music playing thing is is sort of like the eye, and then the manipulation of the variables um, that underlie the algorithm is like the hand. I see. Okay. And that's sort of conceptually how how I thought about it. And I think one thing about upbeat is like it was more neutral musically. Right. Like it, it had some random uh, aspects to it where you could you could do these sort of fills that that would be partially algorithmic, um, and you could sort of decide how much how how algorithmic you wanted them to be. So so I think there's a there's definitely a tension between like since this was kind of a new medium in some in some sense, like there there weren't a lot of examples of this, so. You know, it wasn't clear, like, do you think of yourself as making tools or do you think of yourself as making works of, like, what what are they, these right. things? Like, right. do they represent, real? are they realizations of compositional ideas or, or what? They were certainly sold kind of as tools or things that would address specifically creative, the creative side of music production. You used the word assistant before. That word I didn't really like because it was like, oh, well, it implies this sub subservient role for the computer and then the person using it is like in charge or something right, like that. Right. Um, I'm uncomfortable with hierarchy to begin with in human relations. And then I'm, I guess I'm even uncomfortable with it in the relationship between people and software because I'm like behind the software. And right. so in some sense, I'm like communicating through the program uh, on some level. Most people don't necessarily, I don't know, maybe they, they generally think that the best way they can communicate is sort of disappear. 
But I, I'm not sure I think that way, that maybe expressing yourself a little bit is, is actually okay. Because I, I felt like I was doing something creative. So to just say I'm just being creative, making tools, it kind of felt like less than... Um, That's a, less than how it felt to you, right? Less than how it felt to me. And it also felt like, okay, why is the art reserved for the person using the tool? Right. Sure. But other people would say that's you're just being arrogant, you know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think in the uh, the other side of it, I actually got um I did a thing at Columbia one time and I said the said something about yeah, you know, we're making we're making tools. It's sort of like making the paintbrushes that Picasso uh would have used or whatever and uh Brad Garten uh, basically just just says, you know, that's bullshit. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah. And he's like, yeah, what you're ha- what you're doing has to be creative, otherwise it's not going to inspire the people that want to use this stuff. There's there's a complicated dance going on here that nobody's completely identified, but it's more than you're just making paintbrushes. I was like, okay, I got to buy that. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, I like what George Lewis said about his programs that he writes basically for himself was that mm-hmm. they're the weather. Huh. If he is improvising with one of his programs, like he has basically created this kind of climate that he's going to have to respond to in some way. Sure. Sure. That actually is a really cool way of thinking about it. So the, the programs that you were involved in, in the generous stuff. So, for people who who didn't have a chance to work with them, what were the different programs, and what did each do? So you did you did Jam Factory, you did Oval Tune, you worked a little bit with Upbeat, and then M was M sort of like the culminating. That was the first one. Oh, it was the first one. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, M was the most uh, sort of direct reflection of Joel's conception of interactive composition, where he, he said there, and kind of the way he taught composition in general was to say there are variables and then there are controls. So in M they have these variables uh, which represent different ways of thinking about the music, like think about rhythm, you can think about the pat- the melodic pattern and so forth. And then there, there are controls, like what, how can you influence those things? In M the main control that you had was that you could basically come up with a bunch of alternatives and then you could switch between them in a, a bunch of different ways. Uh, Jam Factory was based on Markov chains, which are a way to capture something about a pattern statistically. Essentially, um, as you play notes into it, it's, it's building this Markov chain that says like, okay, well, if a person has played C, and one time after they played C, they played F, and another time they played G. So um, I will just play an algorithm that says, okay, 50% of the time after I play a C, I can play a G, and 50% of the time I can play an F. I think those are the two notes I just said. Right. Anyway, so it was, it was kind of a way to try to capture what someone played and then play something back that kind of sounded like that. And then on top of that, there were a bunch of controls, somewhat similar to M, that you could manipulate while you're listening to this thing play back the thing that's kind of like what you just played. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can keep playing into it at, as you're manipulating controls as well. I see. Okay. I think that Jam Factory, like it's closer to the way I think about music than M is. I was going to say, um, the way you're describing it actually goes back to you talking about how you you like this idea of randomness as a way to generate lines ra- rather than what lies under the fingers. But having said that, I think that of the music that I uh, ever made with the software, like they're basically kind of produced different results, but like I like them both the mm-hmm. same. Ovaltune was... Uh, so, uh, all right, I'm not going to go into how I thought of this, but um, o- Obletune was um, basically an exercise that I gave uh, some of my computer science students. And the idea was, if you move the mouse on the screen, 
could you make it so that it acted kind of like a kaleidoscope? I realized, like, not only could it make a like an oval on the screen and then make four of them around a point of symmetry, but it could play a note every time it made a shape, and the loudness of the note could correspond to the size of the shape. Mm-hmm. So you could like move the mouse really slowly, and you'd get these like little tiny ovals and really soft notes, and then you could like move the mouse really fast, and you'd get louder notes and bigger shapes. There was no sense that the music influenced the shapes or the shapes influenced the music. They were parallel. So you designed like the shape algorithm and the music algorithm in parallel to each other. And if you just wanted to think of it as a way to perform music, you could do that. If you just wanted to think of it as a way to generate art, you could do that. Um, Or you could do both at the same time. So there was this one guy, and I am spacing on his name, I think... uh, I, I sort of th- can think of his name, but I don't want to. I don't want to mangle it. Anyway, he generated like massive, and I mean truly massive canvases with Ovaltine. Um, he had some technique for printing them out, and he gave me one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, it was probably ten feet long and maybe eight feet high. Oh my god! Something like that, um, and it just had like all these circles and lines and stuff on them in this sort of sort of uh, symmetry but you didn't you could sort of play with that or whatever so in the in the sense it like had a random algorithm about how the notes were selected similar to m and jam factory but it was really about performance in a way that the where the other programs are kind of driven by a clock for the most part right um they did have similar things where you could kind of play notes with the, with the mouse. But so the, um, I think the results of that were, were very different and still, still kind of distinctive. It's too bad that I, I've never kept, I only was able to keep, uh, bring M up to modern computer standards and, and not the other two. But if I had a second, if I had a clone or something like that, I'd love to maybe port them to the iPad or something like that. Sure. Um, I feel like, there, there's all these programs out there that are very much in the same space these days, you know, because the iPad is such a, in particular, is like such a, uh, an, an obvious platform for making interactive composition applications. I don't want to sound like a bitter uh, old guy or whatever, <laughs> but I feel like there's an attribution of innovation for a lot of the people that make these things they kind of don't realize there's a whole history of this that, right. that's a lot older than, than I think they imagine. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, but you, you often have to psych yourself into thinking that you're doing something new in order to, to carry it out. And I'm sure that even what I was doing was not new. And I don't know all the, the intellectual history of these ideas from, from where I got them. So I'm not claiming that you know they're like incredibly original and like brilliant but that they're like the the 80s and 90s versions of these ipad things that you see now and it's kind of interesting to see it's like you know playing music from the 80s and 90s compared to what people are doing now it's like it's different and in kind of a fun way i guess it is although what's interesting to me first of all i think maybe there's not such a decade driven thing because if nothing else um you know some of the hardware sequencing functions that were common in the 80s still are completely the way that we do musical development today the other thing that i think is interesting and and maybe again you can wave me off if you think i'm wrong but it sounds it seems to me like a lot of this stuff was driven by musicians making music not not necessarily the music of the time so for example one one of the things that to me is really indicative of how m works is this concept of a conductor right where you have this little grid and you move a thing and that movement across the grid represents changes in parameters in different ways that actually goes back to what you were talking about in your first 
when you first saw saw uh, Joel work with this mini computer, and he had a way to gesturally move his arms, and that would control parameters. I think that you know, I I think that those things are not necessarily time locked, or at least they don't seem to be so to me because the concepts are are the same. I mean, it, it seems like a commonality of the, of the language of making music with computers, not necessarily something that's tied to a specific time frame. Um, yeah, I mean, there's like a certain aspect of novelty the first time you see that. Right. But it's kind of like, I mean, I don't completely understand. The, on a theoretical level, I couldn't tell you what where jazz ends and rock and roll begins, but... In some ways, like in certain genres of popular music, like the thought processes are very different than in other genres. Sure. Like um, what you're trying to achieve, the way you would organize it. I'm happy to talk about that, like uh, a little bit that has nothing to do with computers. I think that given the materials of computer music, like you're going to fall into the same ideas eventually. This conducting thing is kind of like one of those ideas. It's like, I want to... Uh, it's actually not that dissimilar from the DX7 envelope in some way. It's like, I want to take a space and put something underneath it. I'm going I'm to move in some area of space and uh, I'm going to assign something to happen that's different on the left side of that space than happens on the right side of that space. And that can be arbitrarily complicated, but the space is simple. Right. I was thinking, whereas uh, the space of a saxophone is, seems really complicated by comparison to me. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and I think maybe that's part of the, the challenge is like the space is uh, as a desert at the level of the control. And then it, we're trying to turn it into a rainforest at the level of like what actually happens. Right. That seems like kind of a good jumping off point to start talking about Max. Now, there there is sort of like this canon of uh, where Max came from. And I think it would be great for you to sort of like clarify what that is. So so sort of like the, the broad conception is that uh, you at some point went to... Uh, to your cam, you saw uh, the work that Miller was doing and then roll it up in a hat and mix it around. And next thing you know, you're developing Max for opcode. Now, clearly there's a whole lot more that happens in order for that to occur. Did you kind of like fill in the blanks? Let's see. So the first thing, the first place I heard about Max was a phone call I got. Um, and I can still kind of remember it was a really hot day. It was from Andy Schloss, and I think he was calling me from, from Ircom. And he said, like, yeah, I've just started using this, this really cool program that Miller is working, uh, working on called Max. And it has this, this table object. And the table object is just, like, solving all of my problems. And I was like, you know, he could kind of describe what it was, but I, I was like, okay, it sounds really cool, you know. And then I saw, um, I saw Max for the first time at Karma when David Wessel had come over from Earcom to, to show it. And I was just like, wow, this is like, it's like the generalization of everything I've been trying to do. Right. And David had actually been working on other things that kind of had that sense to MIDI Lisp was, was another thing that he, he loved to, to show people. Where you, where you could have, pretty sure you could, you know, put sliders up on uh, scroll bars or sliders up on the screen, and then they were tied to variables in the, the the Lisp algorithm that you could write, and it would generate MIDI of some kind. I was really, really excited to see that. And as it turned out, I had a, a tour of, a small tour of Europe. I was going to teach some classes about how to develop software for the for the Macintosh that was interact was real time and interactive. The second place I went after I, the first place I went was in Zurich and second place I went was Ircom. And so I taught the class and I showed uh, this program that I was working on which was called Riff. It never was released, but um, the basic idea of it was kind of 
a way to assign, take a picture and then assign different regions of the picture as control parameters for, for an algorithm. I really actually forget what I was thinking because essentially it's like, okay, well, I'm talking about this, but I actually really can't wait for this class to be over so I can talk to Miller about Max. <laughs> and so Miller's like, let's go out for a drink. You know, he gave me a copy of Max that I could play around with. Um, he's like, yeah, I, I really, I really like to have you work on this because I, you know, like to kind of figure out how to make it a commercial product. This is this is sort of interesting in light of a conversation that I was involved with with Miller like four days ago at the David Wessel Memorial, where um, some guy was like sort of trying to bug me and, and Miller at the same time about like. Well, you know, one of you is doing this commercial thing and the other guy's doing the open source thing. And Miller says, you know, in 1990, I wanted to get my ideas out. And the only way I could do that was with commercial software. Right. Seven or eight years later, I had other options. Right. It's really interesting to think that it was just seven or eight years. And the landscape of what you could do when you're writing software had completely changed in terms of getting your ideas out. Sure. Maybe the reason that I've remained writing commercial software has a lot to do with just being in the habit of doing it, continuing to f try to find a way to, you know, ultimately do the same thing as Miller, like get my ideas out, but do it in a way that uh, spreads them. You know, then there's a very there's a difference of how ideas are realized in the, the, the context of a commercial piece of software and the way that they're realized in open source uh, software and, and Miller's definitely a guy who is really interested at the at the idea level not necessarily in the embodiment of the idea level right. and so I think for him engaging me as the person who would like be the embodiment of the idea person made a lot of sense and, and did, I think that did he that pick was, you was a great partnership you know? And did he pick you just because you had done these commercial software packages and so you were kind of in play for that? Um, and also because, like, essentially the what they did was the same thing as what Max did. Oh, sure. Right? Okay. So in other words, it's like there's a lot of commercial software out there, but if you think about a DAW, for example, particularly back in that time period, one of the things is that sometimes you couldn't even edit this, the sequence while it was playing, right? So you'd go into edit mode and you'd mess with your sequence right. and then you'd go out of edit mode and hit the play button and then listen to it. So the idea that there was like this instant change between what the editing is, ha is doing and what you're hearing, which we take for granted now, wasn't really the case in the 1980s. The intelligent music programs, M, Jam Factory, Ableton, they're all like playing whatever is immediately happening with what you're, what you're changing on the computer screen. And that's what Max does. And so they both needed the same kind of, I don't know, inner architecture or whatever. Right. And one of the, one of the things that, uh, based on my relationship with Opcode and Dave Oppenheim, like I got out of working there was some pretty tricky code to you know hack the computer so that it could have a real-time uh, fairly uh, robust timing mechanism and Miller didn't know how to do that I see so that was the there's a feature in Max called overdrive and and that was like the first thing that we wanted to work on was if you move a window or you're like pulling a menu down you don't want the music to stop so that was kind of Miller's agenda. It's like, okay, there are these things I want to do to extend the environment, and I could figure them out, but David already knows how to do them. Oh, that's, uh, that's interesting. So that's kind of how, you know, and I love the software. I was like, yeah. you know, I remember uh, I made, when, I got, when I got the early version or whatever, like I, I did some kind of performance, and uh, I can't remember exactly what was going on, but one of the first objects I wrote was one to control the, the CD drive in the computer so that I could play, like, 
I could seek to certain specific places on, on a CD and play them. And I remember doing some performance, which I suppose violated copyright fair use to some extent, but, uh, using, a, I think it was probably a, a CD of Take Six, which um, is one of my favorite jazz groups. I'm really into uh, harmony and chord progressions, and I think I did some kind of weird MIDI transformation of that ball at the same time, triggering the CD. I remember, I think I said before, the, the performance, like, yeah, I'm going to use this new program called Max, and I, I just think it's the greatest software ever invented or something like that. I felt like I could say that because I didn't, at that point, had hardly done anything. Right. It wasn't, um, your, wasn't your thing, right? You know, and to this day, like, as I, as I think about, like, you know, what's, what's the future of this program? Like, there are just these really subtle things about it that just make so much sense. And, and I don't think that I would have, I, I just couldn't have thought of them myself, you know? Sure. Well, no, but I get to use it as a tool to, to do that kind of thinking now, which is, it just feels like incredibly lucky. So. so how, how much contact do you still have with, with Miller? I mean, my, my sense of it is that you, you guys are friends. But maybe I maybe not. I don't know. But do you talk much about what's happening with visual programming in the music space or in the media space? Is that something you do? No, no. Um, but I would say that we are friends. But I don't bug him very much. <laughs> I feel like he's a you know he's a busy guy, and every time I talk to him, it's really great. But I, I just you know we're busy and. Right. If I don't have something specific to bug him about, just gonna leave him uh, alone. I, I'll leave him alone. Sure. But when I when I first was working on MSP back in the '90s, you know, it was based on the very very early version of PD for some of the code, and he really helped me. We did we did talk fairly often, and I did more aggressively bug him at that time. But since then, I you know only when we're, we're in the same place or whatever. But I um, approach him or whatever. We did, we did sure. invite him to one of the expos. and um, uh, He did he, a fantastic he, thing. He did a fantastic <laughs> thing. And, you know, he, he was the, the most popular based on attendee feedback. His sure. presentation was, was really great and didn't use Max at all. He used PD. So. Well, I think what was interesting about that was that was a time during the expo where it was clear that it, it wasn't necessarily about just about the technology that is embodied in Max, but that it was the overall environment, this environment of what happens if we plug a guitar into some algorithms that are running on a thing, who knows what it is, and who cares, you know, what happens when we do this stuff. And it was sort of like, the reason it was so so wonderful and entertaining was that it was it sort of transcended any specific technology and more was like an embrace of the entire the entire world of what we were all doing yeah and i also think that you know going back to my uh, saying like how i got into being interested in computers and and music having a having a sound in mind the first time i ever heard about miller was in 1982 when I was taking a summer class at the MIT Experimental Music Studio, um, you know, using Music 11. Hmm. And one of the sessions was on wave shaping. And Miller had done some work in, in that area and was essentially interested in, you know, how you can come up with distortion using wave shaping for electric, you know, s sounding like electric guitars. Like, right. So I think one of the things that was so great for the audience was to be exposed to like what Miller is into as a musician. Sure, right. right? To, and to see him playing guitar on stage. Yeah. You know? Like I always knew that was what he was into. Even before I you know, thought of him as the person working on Max. Like he was this, and, and he, like he didn't even show up at that thing. They were just like using an article or whatever that he wrote to illustrate the, the ideas or whatever. So... I'd always known he was into guitars. You know, maybe people had developed an impression of him as some, you know, academic 
or math genius or whatever, but like, that's not, I mean, he's a smart guy, but he also can like, he had you could be in a band he, with him or something. Yeah. He had a passion for playing. Right. Right. So your interaction with Max, you were involved in making the commercialization of it through, was it initially through, um, through Joel's company? Or, music. Yeah. Yeah. And then eventually they passed it on to Opcode in some way, right? Uh, yes. Um, Formally or informally? No, there's nothing informal when you're dealing with Earcom. So okay. right. um, basically there was one, uh, there was an agreement made between uh, Intelligent Music and, and Earcom, and then a three-way agreement between Intelligent Music, Earcom, and Opcode so that Opcode could take it over. It was initially published in 1990, I believe. The mm -hmm. uh, first commercial version came out about, about then. Uh, on, and that was an opcode product at that I point. see. Okay. And it was uh, basically just Max with, uh, I don't know, 100 and 150 objects or something like that. And it was $495. When did the Keyboard Magazine article for that come out? Um, it like maybe 1991, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't have the article anymore, but that really impressed my my mo uh, my future mother-in-law. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, it's funny because that's also when it got in my head, and I remember and what, did, what was what was in your head when you read it. It was possibility. I mean, I had prior to that my my primary experience with doing programming in the musical sphere was actually. So this is when I was sort of like PC driven or Windows driven. No, actually PC before Windows. And um, I used the sequencer, uh, the Cakewalk sequencer. I had, I had moved over to that and they had this language that was called Cal, which was basically, um, I think it was sort of like a music lisp variant, right? And so... I uh, about that completely. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, so you really got to have like an intimate interaction with the parentheses keys as all this programmers tend to have, right? But, um, you know, so I had done these massive Cal programs for doing things like, you know, arbitrarily remapping uh, key presses into drum functions and algorithmically creating drum fills and all this kind of stuff wow. and it was an enormous ass pain it was horrible but was at least timing? it was all right because it was all offline nothing was in real time so you would do something oh, and then okay. you would run your cal program against against the track and then it would just like do magic shit on the track right i see okay and so i'm like you know that was fine but I read the article in Keyboard Magazine because at the time, Keyboard Magazine was the way that you got information about any of this stuff. I mean, if, if Keyboard didn't talk about it, you never heard about it. Especially for me, you know, I'm up in Nose Pick, Wisconsin, so how, how am I going to hear about anything? Um, I read this article and I'm just like, the possibilities, not only of doing this kind of work but but also of doing it in real time and also of doing it what what intrigued me was the the way they talked about sort of like making changes while things were running and um you know there was an implication there but that implication was magical to me and so i remember tra you know um i actually had there's this like whole framework behind this, but my wife, we had just been married, but she had an opportunity to go work in Japan as a teacher for a year. And so I was steering this opportunity to spend a year just sort of like diving into something. And I read this article and I was like, I know what I'm going to spend a year doing, right? So I go down to my local music retailer and um, I'm like, all right, I want this Max thing. He's like, huh? And I'm like, it's from Opcode. He's like, huh? And I, I like pull out Keyboard Magazine and I point to it. And he's, he 
opens up his big catalog and he rifles through it and he says, okay, I can order it for you. And, you know, two weeks later it shows up and it's the big black binder. And I went into the magic place and it was amazing. It was amazing because it was different than, I mean, I'd, I'd been a long time programmer already, but it was a different kind of programming completely and the main thing to me the thing that to me represented a difference from any other programming I'd done was this sense that I could make changes while things were running while things were operating I could make changes and that was stunning because no other programming system at the time came close to doing that right so like with the intelligent music programs you could make changes to the thing that was generating the music while it was running and and so you could be influenced you know the the composition could sort of you could you could have this dance with the composition now you could do the same thing with programming itself right right well it's funny i have the, i have actually an interesting story about this so at the time i was living in this small town north of green bay wisconsin so literally we're talking about wood tick world right and um, I and so the local music people actually music store actually couldn't deal with anything. So my first entree into MIDI stuff was buying things from a place called I think it was called like the Rhythm Center in Atlanta, Georgia. They were one of the retailers that advertised in Keyboard Magazine. I and so I, I call, remember them. Yeah. Yeah. So I call them up and I'm like, I'm like you know, I'm reading about all of these cool things and um, I like doing sort of like composition, but I want some, you know, I want to extend what I can do. And I, I'm reading about this M thing and, and what is it? And is it something that could help me? You know, because these people, so they look in there, they look at their sheets of paper and see that I had bought Cakewalk and some of these other things in the past. And they're like, well... Let me tell you a story about this M thing. Um, I tried making a song in it, and I sort of made it work, but it was kind of weird. And that was the extent of the sales job that they had behind the M product, right? Yeah, that kind of explains uh, a lot about, you know, the <laughs> level of success we had at that point. Well, and I mean, in a way, it kind of explains what happened to intelligent, intelligent music at the time, because they they had sort of like banked on the idea that people would embrace these kind of programs. You know, it was like it was like, well, can I make a Duran Duran tune out of this? Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know that it works. You know, so for me, when I when I got into Max, it was just it was magical because not only did it not work like any music software, but it also didn't work like any programming system that I had experienced either. Which again sort of implies that you had to make up a lot of stuff on the fly in order to even pull this together. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Well, the programming that you do with Max is very different than what you do with M or Jam Factory. Oh, or I see. Of these other the way it's implemented. Right? Yeah, actually, it's not that different. Right? Um, the difference is just that it's like uh, a really smart guy thought about how to generalize all of that. Once you write the program, like what it's actually doing is pretty similar to the kind of thing that I was doing before. But the brilliance of it is this is this generalization. Sure. Okay. All right. um, that makes sense, right? So you know, one of the things that I uh, realized very quickly working working on the software and then dealing with people who are using it um, was that with with M and Jam Factory, I had this massive list of feature requests for you know what, how people wanted to compose with it in different ways. And so now with Max, basically. The answer is just yes. <laughs> right. Like, you can do that. You just have to do it yourself. For a programmer, that's like the best possible answer that you can give someone. No kidding. That's that's really powerful. You published this through eventually through Opcode. 
How much, how were you getting feedback during that time? Because this is all still pre-internet. How were you getting feedback and, and determining how to go forward? Was it mostly coming from academic customers or was it from individual composers? How were you growing the system at that time? I think the main, uh, so I lived in the Bay Area, so, and the main sort of early customer that we had was Sinmat. So David Wessel uh, and the other people there would, would have me over there. And that just the, the interaction that I would have with David, um, Chris Muir, who was also doing some work there at, from time to time, Adrian, they were both developing things for Max and they were using it. And so I felt like that was like my, my user base was right there. Remember just really benefiting from, you know, what they were trying to do and getting, getting ideas. And I started to realize like, particularly if you decided to extend Max with your own objects, like you could kind of build your own world that reflected your kind of corner of how you thought about things. Well, yeah, that's certainly the case with Sinmat, which who developed an amazing library of stuff. Your camp, yeah. your camp too, for that matter. Um, yeah, very different approach. So, so I'd say that was that was the main thing. Is just like talking to people on that level who who were already using it and and trying to develop stuff. We had a product manager, various product managers at, at Opcode who would kind of try to coordinate how we were promoting it or whatever, and they would get some feedback via tech support and, and, and that sort of thing. But felt like maybe through that was, um, you know, there were bugs reported, but really the, the ideas for, for where to take it were, were coming, in, at least in my recollection, from, uh, from Sinmat and that community. Sure, sure. Now I'm I'm curious because um, you have implied uh, within the company, and uh, sometimes I think even without that, this interaction with sort of like a corporate entity and product managers and stuff behind Max wasn't always smooth. And the one that always comes to mind is the implications that you had behind the Max um, character. There was, for people who remember Opcode Max, there was this like wacky, very large headed man that appeared to be in some sort of laboratory. The implications that you've had in the past was that that was not necessarily a desired icon, nor was it particularly anything that anyone embraced. Is that, is that correct in any way? Um, I guess I, I've come to appreciate that it was, you know, not so bad. Uh, and maybe that the right time, maybe it was right for the time. Uh, the guy who, and I think, you know, as a drawing, it's perfectly great commercial art. The guy who uh, worked on it, uh, John Hersey, actually, he's, he's a very cool artist. He also did all the other characters for Opcode, the Vision Man, and there was a galaxy of characters. I can't remember what that, that one was exactly, but so, you know, kind of friendly and approachable. Maybe it wasn't, like, maybe back at that time, I wasn't really in a friendly and approachable kind of mi mindset or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but it felt maybe I think the thing that that bugged me a little bit is like this is a serious program like there's this is you know th there's a lot of of thought and effort going into this and then like you know you got to really be a smart person to use this and um, and why are you putting a cartoon character on right? it? Yeah. this is trivializing you know, uh -huh. right. I I think I've mellowed out you know, <laughs> probably wouldn't necessarily object to i mean anything to like if that got someone to use the program great sure sure um, at this point i'm i'm uh, i i if people could have a experience of you know seeing seeing the world differently kind of uh, along the lines of what you're describing maybe it may have happened to you that that would make my day you know and so if a cartoon character gets gets that happening why not For sure got it um, so at some point, 
And I, I think it's fairly well documented, so people that are curious could do their own research. But um, Opcode sort of like went in a toilet. We'll just say that that toilet was shaped like Gibson. Gibson ends up owning Opcode, and somehow they decide that the proper thing to do is shut it down. And I think a lot of people don't even understand why that would make sense. Do you have any insight onto that? It's still a bit of a mystery, but um, I think a lot of companies that acquire other companies end up shutting them down. Yeah, I'd like to know more about why that is more common than uh, you would think. It seems like most most acquisitions are not a good idea. I think one of the one of the interesting things is that so all the the people who were Vision users after Gibson bought Opcode and then decided to end the uh, development of the the program, like they're basically stuck. Like they invested in learning this tool and there's nothing really that does exactly the same thing and they have to find some other DAW to use and you know they're they're trying to keep their computers going as long as they can and live with whatever bugs there are in the software. But they they basically like this is their creative tool, and it has no future. And Max was basically in the same situation. Yeah, so how did... Uh, the how did only you... difference was that I had the source code. Uh-huh. But the problem was I didn't have the right to sell it. The only thing I could do was resell it. It was a kind of a mess. And the, the, the hero of the, of the story is David Wessel. So at the time, Gibson was supporting research at Sinmat, particularly they're working on uh, hexaphonic guitar effects and uh, other things. Wessel goes to Gibson and says, you know, you basically, you're threatening the tool we have to, to use to do the research. So we can't do, like, we, we are doing the research for you in Max, and we can't do it anymore unless there can be continued development of the software. Like, all you have to do is make a deal with David to, to let him sell the software. To their credit, they were willing to, to work that out, unlike anyone who might have wanted to do something with the vision source code, like they never allowed that to happen. Well, the vision source code or Zeta systems or so many other, I mean, historically important companies or that, that they acquired, it, it's pretty much a singular case where something's come out of that right yes i i really feel like uh you know one of my many ways i lucked out (laughs) well lucked out but the flip side of it is i mean you i think that that might be a little bit playing it light because your development of the MSP software, which was really the start of Cycling 74, took the concepts of Max and made them much more vital and, in a way, kind of like research capable, right? Yes, I think that um, the, the research that Sinmat was doing pretty much depended on MSP. So, yeah, so the timing of this was, was like it was like just in time, right? Sure, sure. But also then, too, you aren't a person that is particularly confrontational, so it probably looked like an opportunity for them to support their forward vision with a person that they could accept, with a person that wasn't going to either be, um, uh, was was neither going to lord the fact over, you know, that that this had happened, um, but was instead was going to just focus on putting together a system that could eventually give them what they were hoping for, which I think is the digital guitar, right? It was like the one case where it was like in their interest not to shut something down. Like in, in, in this case, like they didn't have to do anything. They just had to, call, you know, right. but uh, they, basically sign an agreement and take the money but it was also a situation where it also didn't seem like the person that they were going to do the deal with was going to be an asshole about it, right? Which I think probably is a big deal. I, I, it's funny because I think that so often people look at 
business and assume that it's like, well, this is the sensible route of, of approach, so this is the thing that most makes most sense. And I think that they forget that there's still emotions and egos involved in any business dealing that uh, that occur, right? Well, with few exceptions, I, um, you know, Cycling 74 is basically in a uh, business uh, and increasingly in a, in, a, in a world where people don't think that there should be a business. <laughs> and so they're not used to, we, I think you probably would agree with me, like we're constantly dealing with people who maybe were the only business they ever have to deal with in their professional lives. Right, and so they they bring certain expectations of what what businesses are to us, and my goal is to to subvert those expectations, particularly because many of the people that we deal with like they treat business with a certain level of suspicion, um, and even the, many of the people that we have working in our company, I'm not sure that they that always had aspired to be in, like working for a commercial enterprise. Right. They, they're very idealistic in, in many cases or that, you know, that they would like the product to be successful, but they're not necessarily like the, and I think you probably agree with this. Like the IPO is not around the corner. <laughs> right. I would agree with that completely. Um, how do you see the future? Not just the future of Max, maybe, but sort of the future of self-directed exploration of media stuff. Wow, how do I see this? Well, <laughs> so one thing is maybe just a, a practical thing, which is what did, if you're a user of a, a DAW program, like your output is usually some linear audio files. And you can, maybe not anymore, like there's no... Re- you know, maybe the recording industry isn't what it used to be, but you can put your thing on SoundCloud and people can hear it. I think that people who work in the space of making software, whether it's like, let's say just vaguely in the, the space of M, well, like back in the day, we could put an ad in Keyboard Magazine and maybe we could use a, even a cartoon character and a few people could buy M, they would have the right equipment and they would be um, ad- adept enough to think that it was actually working when they used the software and they'd get some results and, you know, they could appreciate the work or whatever. And appreciating the work is different from just listening to some audio and appreciating it on the level of the music flowing by your ears or whatever. It's like you're appreciating the quality of the interaction and maybe the sound and maybe, you know, what what's going on on the screen and you're thinking about design and you're having a creative experience or whatever. I feel like I would like to be able to go from working on that, you know, the way that you described the magic of, of working on it, on those kinds of ideas to being able to, to put, put those ideas in front of people as easily as you can go to SoundCloud and listen to one of your friends and to get to make that as easy as uploading an audio file to SoundCloud, there's a lot of work to do. That that to me is the missing thing. You know, I, I think it has the the possibility of of transforming a lot of people's lives, and and that's why I feel like it's even though it's a really hard problem to figure out how to get those ideas shared more easily, that that's worth working on. Well, that sounds really exciting. Sounds fantastic, and um, I'll just say personally, I'm really excited to to be involved, and I think that everybody can be excited about the direction that things are going. I want to thank you so much for spending the time. It was a fantastic opportunity to hear about some amazing history. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry to take so much time. Oh no, <laughs> no, it's it's. Believe me, it's my pleasure. All right, with that, I say have a great evening. And there you have it, Lucky Podcast number 74. 
Uh, many thanks go to David for taking the time to do the interview. It was really pretty fantastic, and it was a chance for me to learn a lot about him, and I've known him for a long time. I want to thank you, the listeners, for listening in. Uh, please make sure that you let people know about what's going on here. Otherwise, with that, I'm going to sign off for the week. I'll see you next time around. Thanks. Bye.